exist to see God glorified and disciples multiplied through the power of the gospel. The deeper the trust, the greater the betrayal. When the Roman Emperor Julius Caesar was stabbed to death by a group of Roman senators, his last words were said to be, A tu, Brute, or in English, and you, Brutus. Because his enemies weren't alone in the attack, but Julius' own nephew, Marcus Junius Brutus, took part in his murder. And the deeper the trust, the greater the betrayal. We read earlier in Psalm 41 where David tells the story of where his own son, his familiar friend who sat at his table and ate his bread, his son Absalom betrayed him, sought to murder him, to take the kingdom from him. And that betrayal marred the second half of David's reign and brought him unending grief because the deeper the trust, the greater the betrayal. And today we come to probably the most famous betrayal in human history. Judas's betrayal of, his, of Jesus is so famous that all over the world, even in different countries and in different languages, to call someone a Judas means that they have betrayed you. We know the end of the story. We know before we walked in this morning that Judas betrays Jesus. Jesus. But remember that up until this point, no one suspected that any of the other disciples were capable of betraying Jesus. When Jesus sent out the 72 to heal people and to cast out demons and to preach the gospel, Judas was a part of that group. He had been a close follower of Christ for three years, personally chosen by Jesus to be an apostle. And of all the apostles, he was the only one trusted enough to handle the money bag. But in the end, he would sell his own rabbi for 30 pieces of silver. But what's most remarkable about this betrayal that's different from Julius Caesar's or David's is that Jesus knew perfectly well what was coming. John tells us as early as chapter 6 that Jesus knew that one of them was a devil. And John tells us in chapter 13 that Jesus knew what Satan had put into the heart of Judas. And we know from Psalm 41 that written long ago, the Messiah will be betrayed by a close friend. Jesus knew before the earth was created what Judas would do, which makes John 18 so absolutely unbelievable that Jesus walks into the Garden of Gethsemane knowing exactly what is coming. So if you haven't already, please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 18. We'll be picking up in verse 1. And while you're turning, let me tell you that we're entering the final section of John's gospel. Chapters 1 through 12 are oftentimes called the book of the signs because of the miracles that Jesus did. Chapters 13 through 17 are called the book of glory because of his upper room discourse and his teaching and his high priestly prayer. And then chapters 18 through 21 here that we're starting, it's called the book of the passion. It's called the book of passion because the word passion comes from an old Latin word that means to suffer. So it's in chapter 18 that we begin the story of the sufferings of Jesus, all starting with his betrayal by Judas Iscariot. And my prayer this morning is that you would see that even in this moment of betrayal, that you would see the power and the reign and the sovereignty of Jesus, even in the way that he voluntarily laid down his life. Because in John 18, we're going to see two realities. The first reality is this. Jesus laid down his life of his own free will. We'll find that in verses 1 to 12. Jesus laid down his life of his own free will. Secondly, when we are faithless, Jesus is faithful. We'll find that in verses 13 through 27. When we are faithless, Jesus is faithful. So let's pray and then we'll dive into this book of passion. Almighty God, we know that nothing happens unless you do it or allow it. That includes all of human history. That includes the cross. That includes the present that we're living in. That includes even this moment. So Lord, by your sovereign power, we ask that you would open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, 
And by your spirit, may the sermon that is heard be far better than the one that is preached. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look with me to verses 1 to 4. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met There with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said, Whom do you seek? Jesus had just finished praying in the upper room, so when they're finished, they head to a place where they often went on the Mount of Olives. And John tells us that as they headed over to the garden, they crossed the brook Kidron. Now, the brook Kidron is significant for a couple reasons. First, when King David was betrayed by his son Absalom, we're told that he fled Jerusalem by heading east and by crossing the brook Kidron. And now we have Jesus, the son of David, a descendant of David, who was betrayed and then crossed the brook Kidron here. But here... Not to flee from danger, but to walk straight into it. And so Jesus is walking in the steps of his ancestor David, and he heads into a garden. The other gospels call this place Gethsemane. None of them actually refer to this place as a garden, except for John. But throughout history, we've combined the two names of this place where Jesus was arrested, and it's become known as the Garden of Gethsemane. But only John in his gospel calls it a garden. Why does he do that? Well, I don't think it's a coincidence that Adam and Eve fell in the garden. And now Christ's passion begins in a garden. And soon we'll see that the place where Jesus will be crucified will be in a garden. And that even the place where he's buried and he rises from the dead will also be in the garden. In fact, if you read ahead into the book of Revelation, you'll find that this whole story ends in a garden as well. In the words of St. Augustine, it was fitting that the blood of the physician should there be poured out where the disease of the sick man first commenced. The old Wesleyan John Galter said, The first Adam had everything pleasant in the Garden of Eden and yet fell. The second Adam had everything that was painful and trying in the Garden of Gethsemane, but was a glorious conqueror. Jesus here is not walking in the steps, not just walking in the steps of David, but also Adam. And here he's to fix what Adam broke. Here is he, he's to succeed where Adam failed. Here he's to bring life where Adam brought death. In the other Gospels, we're told the story of Jesus praying Gethsemane. We're told of his intense prayers and how his disciples kept falling asleep as Jesus was agonizing over the cross. And that's where we hear that famous prayer of Jesus Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but your wills be done. John, for whatever wise reason, skips over that story, and he dives right into the action of Jesus' betrayal and arrest. The Pharisees and the chief priests had tried to arrest Jesus multiple times, but had been utterly unsuccessful. So now Judas tells them about a private place that Jesus went to often, And he leads a band of soldiers to find and arrest Jesus. And I just want you to think about something for just a minute. Jesus knew that that Judas was going to betray him. Yet he went to pray in one of his most common places that Judas would have known. If it were me and I knew someone was trying to kill me, I'd be out of the country. I'd be in the last place you'd expect. I would run and I would not stop running. But Jesus does not do any of that. He willingly went to the garden because he knew that's where Judas would look for him. Why? Because no one takes his life from him. He lays it down of his own free will. And notice in verse 3 that Judas arrives with a band of officers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. First, you should notice that Uh, You have Jews and Gentiles working together because even though they hated each other, they hated Jesus more. And secondly, this isn't like a dozen soldiers. Like if you've seen movies of the Passion, it's like 12 guys with some armor and they're showed up. A band of soldiers consisted of four or five hundred men. 
That is a whole army coming at Jesus. And that's not counting the temple guard who were with them. And look at what they have with them. They have torches and weapons in verse 3. And we know that because it was Passover, it was a full moon, there would have been plenty of light out. There was no reason to have torches to see. It was all for intimidation and to make war. These men were, war- were marching off to squash a rebellion. You see, remember whenever Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and the crowd shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. Everyone thought that Jesus was about to stage an insurrection. They expected him to storm the capital and to establish himself as the king of Israel. Jesus' own disciples expected it. I think Peter expected it. And that's why he's going to come out in a second with a sword ready to fight. And so these troops are coming out ready to squash a rebellion and to shed a lot of blood. But what does Jesus do? He comes forward to them and asks them who they're seeking, knowing all that's about to happen. He doesn't hide behind his disciples. He doesn't run. He steps forward. In the words of the old Baptist preacher, Matthew Henry, when the people would have forced him to take a crown and wished to make him a king, he withdrew and hid himself. But when they came to force him to take his cross, he offered himself. He came to this world to suffer and went to the other world to reign. And then look at what happens in verses 5 and 6. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to him, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. These soldiers are shocked to find that the man they're looking for is unarmed and at the front of the line, so much so that as they were standing with Judas a moment ago, when Jesus answers them, they fall to their knees. They fall to the ground. It's not clear in the English, but in the Greek, you should know that when Jesus identifies himself, he literally says, I am. It's bad English to just say I am. So the translators wanted to help us out in the English. And so they added the word he in verses five and six. But literally you could translate verse five this way. Look at verse five. You could read it. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am. And if you've been paying attention in our study of the gospel of John, you'll know exactly why that phrase I am is so important. All the way back in Exodus 3 when Moses sees the burning bush and God Almighty speaks to Moses from the bush, God called himself, I am. He said, I am who I am. And he told Moses, tell the Israelites that I am has sent you. I am is none other than a title for God Almighty. And here Jesus identifies himself both as Jesus of Nazareth and as the great I am of Exodus. Three times John tells us that Jesus said, I am. Once in verse 5, once in verse 6, and once in verse 7. And at the name of I am, these soldiers, Jewish and pagan alike, fall to the ground. This overwhelming force that came to arrest Jesus, this one little son of a carpenter, is overwhelmed by the sheer force of his words. There's something supernatural that has happened here. There's something miraculous in these verses. That by the same voice that calmed the seas and called the dead to be raised, Jesus simply answered these soldiers and by the power of his voice, they fell. World-renowned atheist Richard Dawkins once said, What's going to happen when I die? If I met God in the unlikely event after I died, I think the first thing I would say is, Which one are you? Are you Zeus? Are you Thor? Are you Baal? Are you Mithrash? Are you Yahweh? Which God are you? And why did you take such great pains to conceal yourself and to hide away from us? Now, there's a lot of problems with Richard Dawkins thinking. Putting aside the fact, uh, putting aside the fact that God has revealed himself through creation, through the scriptures, through the person and work of Jesus, putting all that aside... On the day when Dr. Dawkins meets his maker, there will be no smart remarks. There will be no questions or objections or arguments on that terrible day when sinners must stand in judgment before their maker. Because the power and the holiness of God will utterly overwhelm them. 
Even when the prophet Isaiah had a vision of God, he cried out thinking that he was going to die because he was so sinful. A prophet of God, when he stood before his maker, fell down on his face and cried out, I am a man of unclean lips. In the book of Hebrews, we're told that it's appointed once for a man to die and then comes the judgment. And there is a day when all will stand before their maker and give an account for how they lived their lives. That there is a day coming when you will stand before God and like the prophet Isaiah, you will realize how unholy you are compared to a holy God. There is a day coming when at the voice of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, either willingly or unwillingly. And here in the garden, Jesus displays that power to make it crystal clear that if he had not willed it, he would not have gone. That if he had not volunteered, they would have never survived. But here, as they fall at the voice of the I am, Jesus speaks again. Look at verses 7 through 9. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me. I lost no one. Look at what Jesus does here. The arrest warrant would not have just been for Jesus, but for everyone associated with him. There should have been 11 more crosses up on Calvary, but Jesus steps up, speaks out, and he takes the wrath For his disciples. Even hours before he goes to the cross, Jesus is giving us a picture of what he's about to do. You see, Jesus came to this earth, he took on flesh, and he lived an utterly sinless life, the life you and I could have never lived. And when he was crucified, he drank the cup of the wrath of Almighty God that we deserve to drink. He stood against our accusers and said, Take me. Let these go. And Jesus does not lose any who are his. But of course, Peter does not understand any of this. Peter is ready to fight. And look at what he does in response to the scene in verses 9 through 12. Or verse 10 through 12. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Let's stop right there. Peter told Jesus earlier in John 13, I will lay down my life for you. And remember what Jesus told Peter. Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the roaster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And maybe Peter was thinking about this conversation And so as he's listening to everything that's happening, he has his sword ready and he slashes at one of the guard and chops off his ear. Surely he was aiming for the head, but Peter was just a fisherman and probably had never used a sword in combat before. So he misses. And in the other gospels, we're told that Jesus healed Malchus's ear. And for some wise reason, we're not told about that in this gospel. And just to say as an aside, There's a real danger when we read the gospel stories to try to combine all the details from the gospels to make one unified story. And and I understand the tendency to want to do that because we believe this happened. We believe this is history. But don't miss the beauty of each individual gospel. John chooses to tell some stories and not others because he's focusing on certain aspects of the story. And here he chooses not to focus on the healing power of Jesus, but on the words of Jesus. Jesus tells Peter to put away his sword for shall I not drink the cup that the father has given me? That's the focus. Even though John had left out the prayers of Gethsemane, we still hear the language of that prayer. And Jesus came to this earth to drink the cup of the wrath of God. And he's telling Peter, would you stop me from accomplishing the mission I came here to do? Would you stop me from doing the Father's will? Peter, would you stop me from saving you? You know, it's interesting that he calls it his Father's cup because even though he knows he's about to be tortured and killed under the hands of the Jews and the Romans, 
they're not ultimately why he's suffering. Jesus did not die because the Jews plotted against him. He was not crucified because the Romans convicted him. Jesus went to the cross to suffer the wrath of the Father on behalf of sinners like you and me. You see, the only hope we have on the day of judgment is his sacrifice. The only hope we have for when we stand before a holy God is the fact that Jesus went to the cross. And today, if you put your faith in what Jesus did on the cross, you will be saved. If you turn from your sin and trust alone in the sacrifice of Jesus, then you won't need to fear the power of Jesus on the day of judgment. Instead, Jesus will stand to defend you. On the day of judgment, he will say, I died for him. I died for her. They trusted in me. And by my blood, they have been made completely clean. And that's why Jesus went to the cross. And so he tells Peter to take a step back. And in verse 12, the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And off Jesus goes. It's crystal clear that Jesus did in fact lay down his life of his own free will. And that's the first reality we find in John 18. But the second reality is this. When we are faithless, Jesus is faithful. Look with me to verses 13 through 14. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Let's stop right there. I'll just say in the Old Testament, the Israelites were commanded to have one high priest who served for life as the leader of the temple. But when the Romans took over Israel, they said that guy has way too much power. So they changed the system (laughs) so that the high priest would only serve for a year or two. Um, And oftentimes you would have multiple, if not dozens, of high priests living at the same time. Annas was one of those living high priests. In fact, he had many sons and son-in-laws who also served as high priests. And because Annas was the head of this high priestly family, many would have considered Annas as the true high priest, the one who really should have been in charge according to the Bible. And so Jesus is first brought before Annas. But John reminds us in verse 14 about Caiaphas' prediction. And if you remember back in John 11, the religious rulers were worried about Jesus upsetting the Romans and starting an insurrection. So Caiaphas made the argument that it would be better for one man, Jesus, to die rather than for the Romans to come and kill all the people and to take away their temple and to take away their power. That Caiaphas and the religious rulers plotted long before this moment that Jesus was a guilty man before he even stood trial. But the thing was, Caiaphas was so blind that he didn't realize how true his words were. That Jesus would die for the people, but not in the way that Caiaphas had envisioned. And then what's so interesting about John 18 is that right in the middle of the action, Jesus is about to have his day in court. John redirects our attention away from Jesus And we take a look back at the Apostle Peter. Look with me to verses 15 to 18. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside of the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. Stop right there. We have two apostles in this scene who were brave enough after they scattered to follow Jesus to the high priest's house and to see what happened. We suspect that the unnamed disciple in John 18 is actually John himself. John doesn't name himself a single time in this gospel uh, out of a spirit of humility, but just for our own clarification, we think it's probably John. It's also interesting that we don't get the story of the trial before Annas in any of the other gospels. This is unique to the gospel of John. And you may ask the question, why don't we get that in the other Gospels? Well, I think the reason that we only get the the trial before Annas in this Gospel is because John was there 
is that he was the only one in the room when this happened, and that's why we get it in his gospel. Uh, We don't know what the connection is, but in verse 15, we're told that John was known to the high priest, and so he has access to the trial. And it was common practice in Israel to employ women as doorkeepers. So there's the servant girl standing at the door to Annas' house. And Peter and John, they walk up. The girl knows John. She already knows who he is. She already knows that he's one of Jesus' disciples. But then she turns to Peter in verse 17 and she asks, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? And in a moment of weakness and betrayal, Peter says, I am not. The one who swore he would die for Jesus. The one who was swinging his sword just moments ago. The great apostle Simon Peter denies his teacher out of total fear. So he goes over to the fire with the servants and the officers and he warms himself. Possibly to try to warm himself to to not arouse any more suspicion. And then once again, you see what John does right in the middle of the action... He doesn't finish the story of Peter. He redirects our attention back to Jesus. So so look with me to verses 19 through 21 and notice what John does. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. Now, I'll stop right there, and let me just explain. This is a kangaroo court, if I have ever seen one. First off, in an ancient Israeli court, you were never supposed to have a trial at nighttime. It was illegal because trials were supposed to happen under the light of day, under scrutiny. Secondly, it was illegal to question a defendant. Why? Because it's the same reason we have a Fifth Amendment in America, that in a court when a person is being prosecuted, they shouldn't be the ones that have to provide the evidence against themselves. The same was true for Israeli courts. The case was, the case was supposed to be built on the testimony of two or three witnesses, which is why when Jesus is questioned, he says, I taught everything in public. Ask any of the thousands of witnesses about what I've taught. And Jesus was brought here to be judged, and he ends up playing the judge against this cruel and corrupt high priest. Then in the face of this illegal court and their unjust practices, Jesus asks a simple question and he exposes how evil Annas was really acting. And look at how this evil court responds to this accusation in verse 22. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And stop right there. Once again, kangaroo court. We see a guard striking a prisoner, which was absolutely illegal. So strike one, the trial was held at night. Strike two, interrogating the accused. Strike three, striking a prisoner before they're condemned. This court was utterly illegitimate. But look at how Jesus responds in verses 23 and 24. Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Jesus responds in this moment to this wicked court with perfect poise. That he is utterly faithful in the face of evil men. That he does not back down. He does not take back what he says. He again acts as the judge. He simply says, if I've done wrong, witness to the wrong. Why do you strike me? And here Jesus, the true and greater high priest condemns Annas, this corrupt and lesser high priest. And apparently they had no answer, so they just send Jesus on to Caiaphas. And once again, instead of keeping the camera focused on Jesus and and showing us now the trial with Caiaphas, he cuts back to Peter. Look at me to verses 25 through 27. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked him, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Now you may be wondering at this point, why can't John pick a story? 
Why does John keep going back and forth between Jesus and Peter? I mean, seriously, John, just finish one, move on to the other. Have you ever written a story before? What is John doing here? He keeps jumping from one story to the other because he's trying to show the contrast between Jesus' faithfulness and Peter's faithlessness. Jesus shows up at the beginning of chapter 18 and Jesus three times declares, I am, I am, I am. And now we hear Peter saying three times, I am not, I am not, I am not. Jesus was absolutely innocent. And when he was falsely accused and struck in the face, he was faithful to stand his ground. Peter had just assaulted a man. He had just cut off a man's ear. He was absolutely guilty. And here he's in the courtyard, warming himself by the fire. And here is someone who was in the garden, who's related to Malchus. And he says he thinks he saw Peter in the garden with Jesus. I think if I saw my cousin get his ear chopped off by someone, I'd remember that guy's face. So this guy has Peter dead to rights. They had no witnesses in Jesus' case of Jesus doing any wrongdoing. But here is an eyewitness who could have sent Peter to be crucified along with Jesus. So Peter, like a coward, denies being a disciple of Jesus to save his own skin. And he falls. And he denies his master. And as he denies Jesus for a third time, the rooster crows. And I'm sure that it was in that moment the words of Jesus came flooding back into his mind when Jesus told him that he would deny himself three times. And Peter was so confident in his love for Jesus, but in the end we see that it was just pride. That was one of the most dangerous attitudes any man can have is self-righteousness. To see yourself as good and needing no Savior. Peter, Peter did not want a Messiah to die for him. He wanted a Messiah to die for But oh, how badly did Peter need a Savior? How badly did Peter need the cross? And then the question for us is, how badly do do we then need the cross? Because my prayer this morning was that we would see the power of Jesus even in the way that he voluntarily laid down his life. Because in John 18, we found two realities. That Jesus laid down his life of his own free will. And that when we are faithless, Jesus is faithful. And once again, I I know we're so quick to point out how Peter failed. But let me ask you, in what ways have you denied Christ in your own life? I know I have. Peter was scared for his life, but how often are we quick to deny Christ because we're worried about our own reputations? How slow are we to tell others about Jesus because we're worried about how others will think of us? How often are we faithless? But in comparison, how often is Jesus faithful? Well, this morning, I only have one pastoral charge, one way that we can apply the truths of John 18 and see the power of Jesus here. There's a lot that could be said. We we could talk a lot about evangelism and how you should speak for Jesus. We could talk a lot about worshiping Jesus as God because we certainly see his power here. But I just want to focus on the main takeaway from this passage. Number one. Put your faith alone in Jesus. Put your faith alone in Jesus. Your good works cannot save you. Your church attendance cannot save you. Your baptism cannot save you. The only thing that can save any of us is the gospel of Jesus. That's why he lived the perfect faithful life that we failed to live. That's why he voluntarily went to the cross by his own free will. That nothing man can do can save him. And that's why Jesus came to make a way for man to be saved through his name. And if you would humble yourself and put your faith alone in Jesus, he will save you. And never stop looking to Jesus. Never stop anchoring your hope in the cross and never stop relying on him. I think that's why Paul gives us that warning in 1 Corinthians. That if anyone thinks he stands, he should consider lest he fall. That our faith is in Jesus and Him alone. That, that, let me say this. This Reformation Sunday, we celebrate what happened more than 500 years ago. That there was a German monk named Martin Luther uh, who rediscovered this truth that we're saved through grace alone and Christ alone. 
That as Luther was wrestling with the scriptures in his own words, he said, if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, it was I. He was incredibly devout. And as a monk, he would obsess over confessing his sin. That he would spend up to six hours today in the confession booth confessing his sins to a a priest. That often his priest would complain about how often he would confess and how little his sins were. And sometimes he would get done confessing his sins. And as he was walking away from the booth, he would remember one more sin and run back into the confessional. And then despite all this, he would still throughout the day curse because he would remember one more sin that he had not yet confessed. He would fast for days and do everything he could to earn God's favor. And thinking back on this time, Martin Luther said that he hated how righteous God was. That In his own words, he said, I hated the righteous God who punishes unrighteous sinners. But later, as he was studying the scriptures, he discovered that the only way to be made right with God was not by his works, but by trusting alone in Jesus. And it was when Luther realized this that he said, Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates. That Luther didn't discover anything new. We know that he simply rediscovered what we find here in John 18. So on this Reformation Sunday, put your faith alone in Christ alone and be saved by his grace alone. And on that note, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you for gloriously revealing yourself in the person and work of Jesus. May he be our only hope in life and death. And may all we receive with his grace, may we receive it with hearts of humility. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Hi, Taylor Callen, pastor of Oregon Baptist Church. Thank you so much for listening to this sermon. I pray that you are more encouraged and love Jesus and the gospel more after hearing the sermon than when you first sat down to listen to it. Know that that our heart at this church is that this sermon would be an encouragement to you and would be a useful resource, but would in no way replace the pastor that God has called to shepherd you or the church that you're called to be a member of. With that being said, If you want more information about our church or want to hear more sermons, go to horicanbaptist.com.